spreads in the streets as the vigilante continues his destructive crime spree. The public outrage on this criminal beat the plan's motivation for the means of industry. The police are searching for the past, but it's to determine where the man is going to be put to his loss. The police are suggesting that it's worth the chaos of time. As somewhat of a latecomer to the Watch Dogs series, I was a bit struck by how divided the community was with their attitudes towards the games. Some, like myself, found the gritty and morally ambiguous streets of Chicago to be quite enthralling, whilst others couldn't disagree more, arguing that the light-hearted and convivial tone of the sequel to be the most appropriate. And one of the elements of the Watch Dogs games that I see routinely debated by the community is the characterization of Aiden Pierce. For those who are unfamiliar with Watch Dogs lore, Aiden Pierce is the eventually destructive protagonist of the first entry in the series. Loving uncle by day and grey hat hacker extraordinaire by night, Aiden's life is devastated when his niece perishes in a hit meant for him. Unable to cope with such a catastrophe through traditional means, Aiden instead decides to hunt down the ones responsible for his niece's death, all the while fighting crime as the fox. At the end of the game's storyline, while the credits are still rolling, there is a brief interview with the Dr. Yolanda Mendez, the psychotherapist treating Aiden's nephew for post-traumatic stress. Renowned child psychologist Yolanda Mendez is with us. Dr. Mendez, your story is extraordinary. You actually know Aiden Pierce. Tell us how that came about. I met Mr. Pierce through the family. His she expresses her interest in Aiden's abnormal behavior and mentions her book that she's writing to explore the psychology behind this complicated and dangerous man. Regrettably, this book is never made available, but it does bring up a good question. How would one go about analyzing Pierce's actions and thoughts through a scientifically informed perspective? This video essay is largely an attempt at doing just that. My aim is to squarely present an analysis on how important concepts from the behavioral sciences can be harnessed to explain Aiden's fictional behavior. With that in mind, let's begin. To start, let's first turn our attention to the concept of vigilantism. Vigilantism has been a thing for centuries, but in recent times, it has permeated into media and popular culture. Watch Dogs is no exception. Aiden Pierce is, by popular definition, a lone wolf vigilante, and he decidedly accepts this role at the conclusion of the main narrative. I thought I could fix a little girl's death, but instead it led to all of this. Exposed lies, corrupted kings, a broken city, and me, a changed man. I don't look back anymore. I don't regret. Look forward. Everything is connected, and I'll use that to expose, to protect, and if necessary, to punish. But does the vigilantism depicted by this game, and by much of popular media, hold up under a scientific definition? This may seem like a deceptively simple question, but as it turns out, vigilantism is a somewhat understudied topic in criminology, and scholars have struggled to come up with a set of criteria that would conclusively describe practitioners of such an ideology. Some writers have taken reserved approaches to defining vigilantism, arguing that a definition encompassing too large a domain would be inappropriate, whereas other writers take generalization to the extreme by extending the boundaries of vigilantism beyond differentiability. Knowing this, a more suitable definition for vigilantism could lie in criminologist Les Johnston's six-criterion model, which occupies a sort of middle ground between the two extremes. In his article titled, What is Vigilantism?, Johnston argues that for an act to be truly vigilantist in nature, it must include elements of premeditation, private and voluntary participation, reflections of a social movement, utilization or threat of force, origination from a breach of social norms and order, and the control of crime or social deviance through the assurance of security to participants and others. From this perspective, then, all six criteria must be met by one's actions to accurately classify them as a vigilante. In Aiden's case, criteria 1, 2, and 4 are easily satisfied. From events in the game, we see that Aiden, in an attempt to avenge the murder of his niece, plots out his targets and often strategizes his approach. And even outside of the main narrative, when Aiden chooses to intervene in crimes of opportunity, there still exists a minute amount of premeditation within his insistence on visual confirmation of a crime. While small, Johnston does argue that although premeditation is a necessary prerequisite for an act to be deemed vigilantist, the degree of that planning does not necessarily need to be great. In fact, he argues that social factors predisposing vigilantist acts can be the minimal premeditation required within instances of the oxymoronically termed spontaneous vigilantism. That effectively satisfies Criterion 1, 
It can also be observed that Aiden's participation in and commitment to vigilantism is motivated individualistically and intrinsically. According to Johnston's definition, private and voluntary engagement in crime prevention or social regulation essentially exclude the activities of public and commercial solutions for law enforcement. As the motivations for these two groups are rooted in contractual or monetary sources, and the very nature of these groups offer an incomparable authoritative advantage relative to true vigilantist acts. Seeing that Aiden is neither an officer of the law nor associated with a contractual or financial obligation to his actions, he is determinately a private and voluntary participant. That satisfies Criterion 2. And of course, it goes without saying that Pierce does in fact quite liberally use and threaten force upon those that he brands as wrongdoers in a variety of instances. That satisfies Criterion 4 and leaves Criteria 3, 5, and 6 requiring further discussion. Criterion 5 can be easily answered but with one caveat. Murder is most certainly frowned upon by the majority of societies, and it of course is a violation of basic Western ethics. It also disrupts social order, and seeing that the murder of Aiden's niece is the instigator of his vigilantist activities, number 5 is a check, but focus should be drawn to Pierce's motivations for what he does. From his actions and interactions, we see that he does not necessarily manage crime to restore social order, but rather he does so to satiate a personal vendetta. His actions are largely driven by feelings of vengeance instead of altruism, which is interesting to note. Criteria 3 and 6, as Johnston notes, are related, in the sense that the guarantee of security provided by vigilantism comes in a time when security cannot be effectively sought by legal means. As a result, the public shifts its expectation of security from the law to autonomous citizens who take it upon themselves to produce security and justice. According to Johnston, this shift in expectations constitutes a social movement that is reflected by vigilantist incidents. This characteristic, in the context of Watch Dogs, however, is difficult to positively identify. When Aiden reaches a high enough level in the game's reputation system, radio broadcasts can be heard reporting on public support for his actions, but conversely, public support also reportedly dwindles when Aiden's reputation drops past a certain threshold. The city's reaction as depicted by the game is quite reductionist, but taking it at face value, both sides of the spectrum could in theory be evidence of social movements. When reputation is high, it appears that citizens of the game's fictionalized Chicago become confident that security as assured by traditional means is ineffective, adopting a philosophy that prioritizes extrajudicial alternatives. Some citizens believe the vigilante was demonstrating that the police are inept. What do you think about police efforts to catch the vigilante? This guy stands out in front of everyone, and they still can't catch him? Hey, he's making a point. This aligns with what vigilantism seeks to achieve, and is supported by Johnson's discussion of expected security. When reputation is low, citizens realize that vigilantism is an inappropriate solution to a problem that doesn't need solving, strengthening dependence on established judicial entities. He's a criminal! Maybe even a murderer! Why haven't they managed to catch him yet? This second outcome is a case where Aiden's actions conflict with an opposing social movement, which by the definition put forth by Johnston, is not truly vigilantist. Here, it seems that whether Aiden is actually a vigilante is dependent on the individual behaviors of the player, which in turn influences Aiden's reputation in the diegesis. On an additional note, at no point in the game does Pierce explicitly offer blanket assurances of security to the citizens of Chicago. Instead, it appears more that he operates to fulfill his own wants and needs, and it's unclear if providing public security as an autonomous citizen is his intention. We revisit the discussion of Aiden's true motivations being rooted in personal desires, which seems to be an important and recurring theme. Regardless, it would seem that when isolating the scope to one specific potentiality, Criteria 3 and 6 can be satisfied, verifying Pierce's identity as a vigilante. We now have this torturous definition of what it is that Pierce engages in, but we still have no idea why he does so. To explain this, we might want to look more closely at his primary motivator, revenge. The concept of vengeance has been more than well developed by popular media in recent memory, and its overuse as a major plot device has often drawn the dissatisfaction of some critics. Its presence as a driving motive in Watch Dogs was no exception, with many reviewers noting the cliched revenge story as a detractor in the overall experience. But perhaps there are some nuanced implications that all these vengeful plots bring to the table. At its core, seeking revenge is simply an attempt to re-establish equity between two parties after some transgression has disrupted interpersonal equilibrium. 
This disruption can take different forms, but more often than not, it involves the loss of something or someone, be it a loved one, a prized possession, social worth, or something else of great value to the victim. Thus, in pursuit of rectifying the outcomes of said disruption, the victim seeks retributive justice by transgressing against the original violator. The cognitive pathway that victims of the initial transgression then undergo reflects the series of events, starting with the perception and appraisal of an offense as the first stage. Here the victim determines the value, so to speak, of the original transgression by considering several factors related to the act. Tripp, Bees, and Aquino, the authors who wrote on this issue, argue that in a workplace environment, there are three primary factors that are considered. Goal obstruction, rule violation, and status derogation. Indeed, these three factors seem appropriate in a workplace context where offensive actions often remain within a civil realm, but our discussion transcends that realm and encompasses criminal and violent acts. In this context, goal obstruction, rule violation, and status derogation surely could not be the only considerable factors at play. However, notice how these three factors have one aspect in common. They all evaluate a loss of some kind. Goal obstruction is simply the loss of a potential to achieve an objective. A rule violation constitutes the loss of social order and represents the encroachment upon established norms. Status derogation is also the loss of personal reputation and social groups. Having identified this commonality, it follows that when this model is generalized to transgressions outside of the workplace, the appraisal of an offense is more loosely based in the cost of aggregate losses compounded for the victim. Once the victim has adequately evaluated the offense itself, they then intuitively assign blame to transgressors. The valuation discussed in Stage 1 directly contributes to the amount of blame assigned to individuals. Other factors, namely the intentions of the transgressors, come into consideration, and specific people are named as the perpetrators of the offense. At this point, the victim experiences an emotional response, often interpreted as anger, which then sets in place a submechanism generating motivation for taking revenge. According to psychotherapists Dr. Craig Hain and Dr. Anna Marie Weber, the desire for revenge develops initially from the emotion of anger. The authors contend that when anger is suppressed, either due to a lack of an environment for or the ability to express such an emotion, simple anger then advances to the quote, more pervasive and sustained emotion of rage. When even rage is suppressed further, it advances into violent maladaptive behavior, which includes revenge seeking. Experiencing anger, of course, is not the only prerequisite for vengeful behavior, as any event that draws the ire of an individual might trigger revenge seeking if that were the case. Sensibly, Hain and Weber also argue that revenge exists to remedy powerlessness, shame, and the impaired ability to mourn experienced by certain people in the aftermath of a traumatic event. More particularly, during a traumatic event, the victim is unable to effectively defend against another's offensive advances, hence why they are a victim in the first place. This inability becomes a source of painful emotions, like powerlessness and shame, and a desire to address those emotions is developed. To address powerlessness, victims may seek revenge to regain power in and control of the situation, allowing them to discount the failure to defend themselves in the traumatic event. To address shame, victims seek revenge to prove to others that they are capable of defending themselves. And finally, given that the traumatic event involved the loss of life, victims confront death through revenge in an attempt to maintain loyalty to their lost loved ones. Grief, as Hayden and Weber cite, is a long-term balancing act between holding on and letting go, and in trying to maintain loyalty to the dead, victims of trauma become reliant on holding on and incapable of letting go. In doing so, they may plot and fantasize about revenge as a way of holding on and preserving a connection with their deceased loved ones. It is then through these emotional responses where a desire and motivation for revenge is generated, leading finally to a coping response. Responses are not limited to revenge alone. Although that is our focus, more adaptive responses include forgiveness and reconciliation, which tend to minimize conflict. This psychological model of revenge may seem convoluted, but there are some striking parallels found between itself and Aiden's character development. Throughout the storyline, we see revenge as the driving motivator behind Aiden's behaviors, primarily in his investigation and subsequent hunt for those involved in the death of his niece, but also indirectly in his role as a vigilante. We've established that revenge looks to re-achieve equity between two parties. In this case, Aiden is the victim of the initial transgression through the murder of his niece and seeks retributive justice to bring about a subjectively determined, equal and opposite reaction. Immediately following his realization of the attack, Pierce's thought process would first turn its attention onto the outcomes of the attack itself. Much like an insurance claims inspector would calculate the total amount of damage incurred, so too does the first stage of the retributive cognitive process. The two dominant contributors to the initial offense, as evaluated by Aiden, would likely be the loss of his niece's life and the threat of potential future harm to his family, as he cites these as the instigator of his actions. Cost my niece her life. But whatever's in those files will lead me to them. I'm gonna find him with it without you. With you'd be a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> 
Next, Aiden would seek to assign blame to a party that is involved in the offense. It is from here that the game draws a significant portion of its narrative premise, as at the opening of the plot, Aiden is not aware of who approved the hit against him, and had only apprehended the trigger man responsible for his niece's death, Maurice Vega. Now, it would be expected that in seeking revenge, the principle of Lex Talionis might be employed, allowing for compensation that is equal in value to the initial transgression. If this were directly applied, one might reason that the vindictive assassination of Vega would be sufficient retaliation, but the subjective valuation of transgressions often result in the exceedance of equal retaliation as defined by Lex Talionis. <laughs> We see this manifested through Pierce's pursuit of those indirectly involved with the death of his niece, as well as anyone who poses a threat to his family. It would be reasonable to say that he assigned some blame to all these parties. Following blame assignment, we come to the generation of desire for revenge through emotional responses. Interestingly, instances of all four previously discussed traumatic emotional experiences can be observed in the game. Anger is probably the easiest to identify, as its presence is a precursor for eventual violent behavior expressed very often throughout the game. We see the effects of its suppression and subsequent overflow through several instances of unimpeded aggression. Pierce is also shown to experience powerlessness when he admits that he feels guilt for his niece's death. He implies that his quest for knowledge and revenge stems from the fact that he feels he did not do enough to save her. As a result, he tries to recover that sense of control by retributively re-experiencing his precipitating traumatic event in a powerful position, as opposed to his powerless position from the actual traumatic event. Coincidentally, a radio broadcast from the game can be heard discussing this exact same line of reasoning. Is he just crazy? I don't like the word crazy. He has a purpose. He's someone who has lost control or feels out of control. In his mind, he's regaining it. Shame is somewhat similar to powerlessness, but it revolves around the perception of personal inadequacy by others. Here, it appears that Pierce feels shame primarily with respect to his sister. This was expressed through voice lines present in the digital trip alone. This side activity supposedly enters Pierce into a quote, unconscious dream state, allowing him to explore alternate realities and allowing us to peer into his psyche. Whilst immersed in the alone digital trip, one may notice the narrations in the background declaring Aiden's guilt and demanding for his elimination. The voice behind these lines has been identified by the community to be that of Nicole Pierce, Aiden's sister. He is a murderer, a monster. He will lie, he will hide, find him, punish him. He has destroyed lives, families, even his own. Aiden Pierce is a corrupter, a cancer. He has hurt us enough. Never again. From this, it becomes clear that Aiden not only retains immense guilt from the death of his niece, but has also internalized perceived disapproval from his sister. Whether that disapproval is legitimate is irrelevant. What matters is that Aiden thinks that his sister holds a distaste for his actions, or rather his inaction in preventing his niece's death. That theoretical perceived disapproval is ultimately manifested in Nicole's voice, and thus shame is clearly demonstrated within an uninhibited and unconscious mental state that we have the ability to observe. The final emotion left to be discussed is grief, and more specifically, how ineffective mourning can lead to revenge fantasization. Returning to the graveyard scene, we can observe how much Aiden is reliant on holding on, and his intense aversion to the idea of letting go. This is about letting go. I know. We've all suffered a horrible nightmare, but you have to stop trying to fix it. I need to know. Even though his niece is in fact dead, Pierce has difficulty accepting this fact, and in an attempt to salvage an attachment with her, he consequently undertakes retaliatory pursuit as a means to honor her, and to distract himself from acknowledging the reality that nothing he does can reverse the damage sustained by his family. These three emotional responses, when taken en masse, sheds light onto what propels Aiden to seek revenge, and seek revenge he does, capping the end of a long and complicated journey with the ultimate form of retribution, death. But what happens after revenge is sought? Do these motivations just dissolve as if they were never there to begin with? Does Aiden experience a sense of accomplishment? Or perhaps the realization that his personal crusade did nothing but hurt his family further come crashing down, showering him with despair instead? In popular media, the trope of feeling empty inside after committing an act of revenge is used often, and interestingly, Aiden even references this after he kills Lucky Quinn, the mob boss who ordered the hit on Pierce and his family. Quinn's dead. This is the part where I'm supposed to say I feel empty, right? I'd be lying to myself. I finally feel awake. Like I can breathe again. <laughs> 
However, as it turns out, Watch Dogs' narrative decides to take the other path when it comes to the emotional blowback after revenge has been achieved. This raises a peculiar difference. It appears that what Aiden experiences is unconventional with respect to the popular belief that revenge begets emptiness, and thus far, we haven't discussed any scientific evidence to support one or the other. Preliminary past research has found that participants seeking revenge reported feeling worse than those who did not seek revenge, which lends itself in favor of the emptiness trope. It was reasoned that participants who did not carry out revenge tend to trivialize the original transgression, supporting their decision to not act. Those who did follow through with revenge, however, cannot support their decision with trivialization, and extended fixation on the transgression in conjunction with their actions negatively impact their emotions. This theory was expanded on by later research, which found that participants seeking revenge actually do possess the capacity to feel good after an act of revenge, with the condition that they had to be able to convey the message that the original offender did something wrong in their initial transgression. Sensibly, this conclusion was dubbed the understanding hypothesis and is applicable to our analysis. Approaching the climactic moment where Pierce is finally able to exact revenge on Lucky Quinn, there's an interaction between the two. My niece died in that car. Six-year-old girl. Mom, is this what all the fuss is about? Through their conversation, Aiden successfully expresses to Quinn that this whole ordeal was instigated by Quinn's initial transgression, and reciprocally, Quinn visibly confirms that he understands his role in the cause and effect relationship leading up to the present point. Although Quinn never shows remorse for his actions, actually quite the opposite happens, the mere fact that Aiden satisfactorily delivers this message is sufficient to make him feel that Quinn is deserving of his demise. This is what ultimately induces Pierce's feelings of relief and satisfaction, at least temporarily, after his delivery of the final, irrevocable, and ultimate form of punishment, death. Of course, all this discussion of vengeance has led us to lose sight of our starting point, vigilantism. It's difficult to dispute that vigilantism is related to vengeance, as more often than not, those who engage in vigilantist activity have been victim to either the transgression at hand or similar transgressive situations. In one high-profile case from the United Kingdom involving the extrajudicial punishment of unconfirmed sex offenders, it has been noted that a significant portion of participating vigilantes had been victims of sexual abuse themselves. Some have speculated this vigilantist reaction to be a result of acting out and Freudian projection from past trauma, which we will dissect later. Others have also pointed out that a common characteristic of vigilantist crime and rampage violence is the perpetrator having felt marginalized or victimized, and preliminary quantitative studies have found a significant relationship between victimization and vigilantist participation. While that's not to say that every vigilante is seeking revenge, the line between the two may be difficult to discern at times. Aiden is one of these cases, as his behaviors are both in line with the cognitive model for vengeance and approximately satisfy all criteria for true sociological vigilantism. So is the latter a result of the former, or the former a result of the latter? The answer may actually be neither. It's possible both types of behavior are linked to a third confounding variable and our next topic, control. Despite our extensive discussion regarding how an initial traumatic transgression can elicit a eventual response, revenge is only one of the many possible consequences of psychological trauma. Traumatic events, to the victim, are seriously distressing incidents that can wreak chronic emotional and behavioral havoc, resulting in a cascade of compulsory responses reflective of what is now called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. For many who have to deal with PTSD, the motif of reliving the traumatic event is a perpetually difficult struggle, ranging from the intense physiological manifestations of the traumatic event during nightmares to the deliberate reseeking of situations similar to that of the original precipitating event that could injure the subject further, a process known as repetition compulsion. As a result of this, victims also experience what are classified as avoidance symptoms, essentially attempts to distance oneself from the traumatic experience in order to avoid potential bouts of re-experiencing. There are several points throughout the game where we can see the effects of traumatic stress manifesting in Aiden, from the uncontrollable nightmares of his niece's death, I'm sick of remembering her that way, to his aversion to recollectively evocative locations. I haven't been in Nikki since the funeral. Am I ready? Trauma seems to be an important element that motivates much of the plot's significance. As such, it would make sense to dedicate a portion of our time to the reconciliation of psychological trauma with Aiden's maladaptive behavior and one specific context within which this should be examined is the idea of control. Control in itself is quite an ambiguous idea, but there have been many attempts to conceptualize it as a psychological construct. Perhaps one of the most well-known of these is Julian Rotter's Locus of Control. In 1966, Rotter published his preeminent paper on this topic, titled Generalized Expectancies for Internal versus External Control of Reinforcement. In it, he proposes the construct of locus of control, characterized as a trait describing whether one attributes the outcomes of events to themselves or to other sources. 
Naturally, this construct can be visualized along a one-dimensional continuum, with one end representing internality, or attribution to self, and the other end representing externality, or attribution to the environment. A person who is highly internal on the locus of control scale believes that in any given event, they are able to exert substantial change on the outcome, whereas a person who is highly external on the scale believes that they are able to exert little or no change on the outcome, and that the effects of any cause is purely reliant on chance or environmental factors alone, and not as a result of any individual action. Most people would likely fall somewhere along the middle of the scale, as locus of control is not a strict dichotomy. Alternatively, there are other conceptualizations of control, a more prominent one being perceived control. Although similar to locus of control, perceived control differs in that it does not necessarily describe a location for outcome attribution, but rather merely the degree to which one believes that they can control their actions or environment. These two constructs are very similar in nature, and it would not be difficult to naively assume that one implies the other. In fact, even the scientific community commonly uses these two terms inconsistently, and as such, has led to confusion. Although it should be recognized that these two terms are nuanced and distinct, for the elementary purposes of this analysis, it may be in our best interest to lump the discussion of control into one broad concept, incorporating both locus of control and perceived control under a single penumbra. In doing so, and applying this simplified understanding to Pierce's character, it can be identified that Aiden would likely place highly on both control scales. We can come to this conclusion from his behavior across the narrative, for instance, his adamance in surveilling and protecting his family, even against their will, reflects an inner belief that he is able to enact change in his environment should something happen to them. And this belief is even verbally expressed by Aiden in the final act. It is by way of these elements that we, as a player or viewer, gain a glimpse of the concealed present motivators of his actions. The operative word, though, is present. We can observe how high control might induce these behaviors during the observable diegetic timeline, but not before. This makes it difficult to comment on Pierce's tendencies with respect to control before or during his precipitating traumatic event. Now, the relationship between trauma and control is significant, primarily due to the fact that in the majority of such events, the outcomes of the situation are out of the victim's hands. Otherwise, the undesirable consequences of a traumatic event could be easily avoided. But since that is not the case, experiencing trauma could impact one's views on control. With that in mind, it's entirely possible that Pierce's high control is resultative of his niece's death, and in exploring this possibility, a review of the extensive body of research on trauma and control is invaluable. A concept that is exceptionally helpful in understanding the dynamic between control and trauma would be the temporal model of perceived control and post-traumatic distress, which separates the concept of perceived control into three main time-dependent categories. Defined by this theory, perceived past control refers to an individual's retrospective belief of possessing control during some initial traumatic event. Perceived present control refers to an individual's belief of possession control over the impact or effects of the initial traumatic event within the current circumstances. And perceived future control refers to an individual's belief of possessing control in preventing or avoiding the potential future instances of similar trauma. Curiously, it was found that victims of sexual assault trauma display significantly worse psychopathological outcomes if they displayed higher perceived past control and significantly better psychopathological outcomes if they displayed higher perceived present control. The authors of the study rationalized that if a victim were to believe that they had the ability to control the situation during the initial precipitating event, and yet did not do so, there exists a considerable amount of retrospective self-blame that contributes further to emotional distress after the fact. To rationalize the relationship with perceived present control, the authors argue that victims who believe that they are able to exert change in the aftermath of a traumatic event are more likely to be active in the recovering coping process, leading to better outcomes. This is an interesting assertion, but it doesn't stop there. Several other studies investigating how trauma shifts one's views on control have found that within both the constructs of locus of control and perceived control, experiencing a traumatic event is correlated with decreased measures across the board. Further research has also found that victims who display lowered measures of control after traumatic events also experience more severe symptoms of PTSD. These findings are notable, but do they mutually support each other? Well, one hypothesis proposed by the authors of the latter study might be the key in connecting these ideas. In a secondary hypothesis introduced by Kushner, Riggs, Foa, and Miller, the researchers suggested that in a given trauma victim who initially possesses high measures of control, the experience of an uncontrollable and distressing event could precipitate a quote, pathogenic plummet in perceived control when the invulnerability myth is suddenly shattered. As a result, this abrupt realization that one may not be as powerful as they had apparently thought brings on substantial psychopathological upset, exacerbating the already fragile post-traumatic state. Harking back to the temporal model of perceived control and post-traumatic distress, it becomes clear why higher past perceived control might be related to self-blame and worsened outcomes, given a greater possible descent in perceived control. Furthermore, it would not be a stretch to say that the impact of present perceived control on better psychopathological outcomes additionally serves to address the invisible pressures of lost control. Unfortunately, although this idea is logical, 
There presently is no support from literature that suggests this is the case for established constructs of control, at least to the best of my knowledge. But taking a step away from strict empirical psychology, one should acknowledge that in the clinical treatment of PTSD, regaining control in one's life is customarily a sign of recovery, typically coinciding with the general diminishment of symptoms associated with the disorder. On a related note, maladaptive manifestations of control have been reported, primarily within the phenomenon of super control, whereby a traumatized individual attempts to govern every detail of their life with great overcautiousness, often to avoid a recurrence of the traumatic event. Another such manifestation is repetition compulsion, which as mentioned previously, is a deliberate reseeking of the traumatizing event in pursuit of developing mastery over it. Both behaviors, although harmful, are in fact coping responses that are instigated when one's command of the circumstances has been threatened. Knowing this, perhaps more significant consideration should be given to the aforementioned possibility. Now that a working and coherent model for control within trauma has been established, it is now possible to apply these concepts to our subjective analysis. While we cannot accurately hazard guesses about Pierce's behaviors prior to the timeline covered by the game, any actions or details that exist within the scripted or narrative sphere could provide useful information. We've already touched on how psychological trauma has affected Aiden, but with trauma being such a central theme within the narrative, a more extensive discussion of how post-traumatic stress is represented within the game is warranted. In the clinical diagnosis of post-traumatic stress, the gold standard is often cited to be the clinician-administered PTSD scale, often abbreviated as CAPS. Typically, the CAPS is administered by trained specialists in an extended interview format, which then allows for a provedly valid evaluation of the presence of PTSD. Admittedly, this process is lengthy and resource-heavy, prompting some clinicians to use less complicated diagnostic methods. One such method is the PTSD checklist, the most recent version of which is abbreviated as the PCL-5. The PCL-5 is a 20-item questionnaire that can be quickly administered to incoming patients and is notable for its favorable diagnostic accuracy. Commonly used as a screening device, it also plays a convenient role of providing us with a set of criteria characteristic to post-traumatic stress. Going through the checklist, it becomes clear that Aiden, to the best of our knowledge, suffers from at least 10 of the items to some degree. For starters, it can be observed that he does in fact experience unwanted and uncomfortable memories of the traumatic event from the Remember sequences. The player is also shown Aiden's repeated experiences with nightmares. Both of these are classic signs of re-experiencing in trauma that match items 1 and 2. Next, we also see that as a result of his niece's death, Aiden experiences a considerable amount of negative affect. Some of this exists as shame and self-blame, which we have discussed before, but another portion has been translated into pessimistic preconceptions about the world. Of course, it doesn't help that many of these preconceptions aren't far from the truth, which may or may not have played a part in Aiden's violently vengeful response to his loss. Additionally, hypervigilant and socially avoidant behaviors can be found in several of Aiden's interactions, further demonstrating the psychopathological impact that the precipitating event has had on his life. From here, it becomes apparent that there are extensive similarities between the symptoms of PTSD and the onset of Aiden's physiological, emotional, and behavioral troubles. What's even more interesting though, is how his measures of control might influence these symptoms and responses. Returning to the temporal model, recall that there exist the separate constructs of past, present, and future perceived control. Aiden, as an individual who prides himself in his ability to manipulate his environment, both physically and psychologically, could be reasonably conjectured to place highly on measures of control before his niece's death. Because of this belief, the invulnerability myth would dictate that he perceives himself as an omnipotent power, and by extension, his family as a protected party. Of course, that belief is destroyed when his niece is killed, shattering that myth altogether. At this point, given his confidence in his ability to protect his family and subsequent failure to do so, Aiden's measure of past control can be identified as high, but immediately following the precipitating traumatic event, he suffers a catastrophic drop in his perceived control, as the loss of his niece is apparent proof that his preconceived capabilities did not hold true. This can be observed in his flashback to his conversation with Nicole at the cemetery, in addition to his reflections on said conversation. Lena's dead, I can't change that. How do I just walk away? As discussed previously, with this realization comes substantial psychological discomfort and negative affect, exacerbating the already fragile post-traumatic state. Seeing that Aiden now possesses significant doubt about his ability to evoke change in his surroundings, it would be logical to conclude that his measure of present control is also low. But as the narrative events show, that is not the case. Aiden, in many instances, continues to be quite controlling in his behaviors, presumably even more so than in the past. This seems counterintuitive to the line of reasoning this far, but considering the worsened symptoms of post-traumatic stress, one possible justification is that for Aiden, psychopathological distress is severe enough to encourage self-administered reparative behaviors. In effect, Pierce is motivated out of mental discomfort to regain mastery over his environment, falling back on past patterns of controlling behaviors as a coping mechanism. This possibility is alluded to near the beginning of the game, 
I need to get my mind off things. Lucky for me, this city's full of distractions. And they can't hide from me. When Aiden's experience with his post-traumatic stress is intense, he seeks dangerous situations of which he can influence the outcome a la repetition compulsion. This reaction would then register as high present control and offer one explanation for Aiden's manipulative, vengeful, and vigilante behaviors as stemming from the preservation of emotional stability. Although trauma and control offer one explanation for Pierce's actions, other disciplines of psychology can propose alternative interpretations. One such perspective that can offer new insights is that of psychodynamic theory. Psychodynamics refers to the study of psychological forces and energies that govern human behavior, thought, and emotions, and it is deeply rooted in the philosophies of Sigmund Freud. Freud is famous for introducing numerous theories that revolve around his central doctrine of psychoanalysis, many of which were radical and initially ill-received, but came to prominence in the early and mid-20th century. Although still prevalent in popular culture, most of Freud's propositions have since been retired from clinical applications. Some have argued that his theories are unscientific and unfalsifiable, given that concepts like the unconscious, which by its very definition is obscured from the purview of human observation, is not able to be empirically studied or tested. However, one theory that does show empirical promise is the role of defense mechanisms in addressing anxieties, defined in psychoanalytic theory as internal conflicts between structures of the psyche. In Freud's original conceptualization of the psyche, he theorized that there existed three distinct structures, the id, ego, and superego. The id was proposed to handle irrational and emotional processes, which spawned basal desires that humans instinctively hold. Conversely, the superego was proposed to handle moral and restrictive processes, internalizing social norms and bringing order to one's behavior. And finally, the ego was said to play a mediating role between the id and superego, rooting processes within the realm of reality. In the event that the delicate balance between these three structures is upset, whether a result of overbearing social pressures or overwhelming internal desires, anxiety is created, leading to the experiencing of negative emotionality. And so the ego's approach to combating the effects of anxiety is through defense mechanisms. Now defense mechanisms are not to be confused with coping mechanisms or coping strategies, which were mentioned earlier in the discussion about control. While similar, the simplified distinction between the two lies critically in consciousness and intention. With a focus on the unconscious that psychoanalytic theory holds, defense mechanisms should naturally be rooted in the unconscious, such that its defense against anxiety is completely involuntary. This is then usually accomplished by altering one's perception of reality, distorting it to various degrees, or by unconsciously directing anxiety towards alternative outlets. Coping mechanisms have a similar goal. Its aim is to reduce negative affect, but it deliberately originates from a place of conscious intent. More often than not, this manifests through seeking to physically change one's reality, as opposed to the mere distortion of one's perception. Hence, the preceding categorization of Aiden's controlling and vigilantist behaviors as such. From a psychoanalytic perspective, however, these behaviors are not the result of him actually trying to mitigate his anxieties, but rather a set of deterministic actions derived from unconscious drives. Defense mechanisms come in a variety of flavors and span across four main hierarchical categories. The first level, known as pathological defenses, involves breaking down one's perception of reality in an attempt to eliminate the anxiety altogether. If the mind doesn't recognize a conflict existing between reality and one's inner desires, then anxiety isn't produced. These mechanisms are typically found in children. The second level, termed immature defenses, are a set of mechanisms that are typically socially aversive and heavily distort one's perception of reality in order to suppress anxiety. The third, neurotic defenses, push out anxiety-inducing thoughts from one's awareness and are typically more socially adaptive than the previous two. The fourth and final level, mature defenses, tend to instigate feelings of gratification, diverting anxiety into more positive avenues. These four levels form a hierarchy of both psychopathological severity and maturity, with pathological defenses being most distortive to one's psychological and social function, and mature defenses being most psychologically and socially adaptive. Within this analysis, we will discuss five of the most applicable mechanisms, projection, reaction formation, displacement, sublimation, and rationalization. Starting with projection, it's interesting to note that the game itself brings up this defense mechanism when characterizing Pierce in an audio log recorded by Damien Brinks, the main antagonist. Oh well, the police are in quite a frenzy. The vigilantes twisted their panties in a knot. If I were to psychoanalyze Aiden, I'd say he's projecting. He can't fix the death of his knees, so he's fixing all the other injustices littering our street. Maybe that helps scratch the itch. But it doesn't answer the question that must be nagging at him. Who killed his knees? Indeed, Freudian psychology and greater psychodynamic perspectives have permeated into popular culture, and Watch Dogs is no different in this regard. But whether the implementation of these ideas is true to their scientific origins is a subject of debate. 
In the audio log, Branks claims that Pierce is projecting the anxiety of his niece's death onto indiscriminate crime, and implies that the anxiety Aiden faces derives from his is desire to save his niece, and his super ego's rational understanding that such a reality is temporally impossible. On a superficial level, Branks' claim seems to be more or less correct, but upon closer inspection, the usage of projection is not accurate to its definition. Projection, and more specifically non-delusional projection, refers to the transfer of objectionable qualities or desires from oneself to another. To give a theoretical example, a thief who knows that stealing is wrong may be inclined to accuse those around him of stealing from him, thereby assigning a quality or desire from the self to another person or persons. Knowing this, Branks' analysis seems to be somewhat inaccurate. If Aiden is truly projecting his own failure to protect his family, he should be accusing others of not protecting theirs. This doesn't seem to be the case, and it doesn't really have much to do with his role as a vigilante. Despite Damien's argument of projective defense not holding much water, his general idea might be able to be justified using different defense mechanisms. Reaction formation is one possible alternative. Unlike projection, reaction formation is a process of reversing one's anxiety-inducing qualities or desires to their polar opposites. A frequently cited example of this is extreme homophobia adopted by some closeted gay individuals, as their sexual orientation clashing with their moral or social restrictions is a source of anxiety. For Pierce, a man who has a storied criminal past, anxiety could be generated from a recognition of his undesirable criminal tendencies and their detrimental effects to his and his family's well-being. As a result, he becomes drawn to the opposite pole, embarking on his anti-crime crusade throughout Chicago. This is supported by a rare moment of introspection near the conclusion of the main narrative, where Aiden expresses doubt over his role as an arbiter of justice and shame over his past actions, revealing that the previously mentioned source of anxiety may in fact exist. How many people have I hurt? Killed? Who deserves to die? Who decides that? But yet another problem exists within this theory. Typically, reaction formation allows for the original desire to be restrained. That is, the original desire is not acted upon, but remains in the unconscious. In essence, the polar opposite reaction that is formed replaces the original desire altogether in practice. In this case though, vigilantism simultaneously satisfies the original desire of aggressive criminal activity, yet also purportedly maintains de facto criminal punishment. This realization begs the question of whether Aiden's vigilantism is truly an example of reaction formation, or merely an outlet that is capitalized upon to satisfy the original desire of criminal activity in a less deplorable manner, conveniently segueing us to the perspectives of displacement and sublimation. Simply put, displacement is the relocation of emotions, ideas, and desires to other items or people, and in the broad sense of the term, could refer to cases of projection. More frequently though, displacement refers specifically to displacement of object, where the object upon which unacceptable desires are enacted is reassigned to an alternative object. A classic example of this is someone who is frustrated with their workplace may become domestically abusive, taking their aggression out on family members. Sublimation is related to displacement in that it redirects unacceptable desires away from their original pathway towards an alternative outlet. The distinction, however, is in what kind of outlet is used. In sublimation, unconscious desires are satisfied through socially acceptable or constructive behaviors, justifying its classification as a mature defense, as opposed to the potentially destructive nature of displacement, which is categorized as neurotic. Additionally, unlike other defense mechanisms, sublimation is theorized to hold long-term stability, allowing for little distortion to one's perception of reality. To give an example, a person who experiences strong impulses of aggression may be drawn to pursue a career in athletics or law, both of which are socially constructed spaces where aggression can be expressed in an acceptable manner and in the long term. These two mechanisms in conjunction can be used to offer an additional explanation of Pierce's vigilantist, vengeful, and controlling actions. Much like the example of aggression and career choices in athletics or law, Pierce's role as a vigilante can be argued to be more or less his vocation. As mentioned previously, he does wholeheartedly embrace this role at the end of the narrative, and assumedly dedicates a considerable amount of time fulfilling these duties, which is implied by subsequent works. It's then possible to speculate that although the extrajudicial delivery of justice is coincidentally antithetical to Pierce's unconscious desires, he still uses vigilantism as a sublimated outlet to engage in criminally aggressive and violent behavior, in what some may call a socially constructive environment. This is supported in part by Pierce admitting that his participation in vigilantism is a source of mental relief for him, attenuating anxieties sourced from his criminal desires conflicting with moral constraints. I need to get my mind out of things. Lucky for me, this city's full of distractions. And they can't hide from me. Furthermore, Aiden's acceptance of his role as a vigilante, in addition to the stable, long-term perpetuation of related activity as a means of anxiety relief, lends further reinforcement for this theory. 
The issues of vengeance and control hitherto discussed can supplementarily be rationalized through displacement. If consideration is given to the trauma Aiden sustains, it stands to reason that there exists some kind of anxiety produced from this damaging experience, namely a conflict between controlling the original precipitating event and the physical inability in accomplishing such a task, similar to the conflict found in the previously discussed projection theory. Then, the application of displacement to this anxiety would suggest that in order to escape the psychological discomfort that accompanies inner mental conflict, Aiden must reassign the object upon which he wishes to realize his desires. Thus, instead of fixating on the original trauma, he seeks to command other aspects related to his niece's death. His family's safety, his pursuit of perpetrators, his socially manipulative behaviors all extend from his displacement of control from a past occurrence to present analogs, lending agreement to the earlier discussion on trauma and control. Perhaps this line of reasoning is what Branks was referring to in his commentary on Pierce's psychology, merely using an incorrect term to describe a reasonable analysis. Of the different theories put forth thus far, this theory regarding sublimation and displacement is the most consistent, however one discrepancy still remains. Although sublimation offers an alternative outlet for Aiden's criminal tendencies, the fact remains that this outlet is contradictory by nature, fighting violence with violence and fire with fire. An inquisitive observer might ask, would the goal of containing crime and bringing justice to his niece not be at odds with his criminal and violent actions, creating yet another source of anxiety? Well, the final defense mechanism, rationalization, seeks to address this conflict. Rationalization, as its name implies, is a process of justifying events and actions after their occurrence, and in so doing, ostensibly resolves inner conflicts from the perspective of the individual using this defense. Very quickly then, several rationalizations can be formed from the post-conflict, a utilitarian outlook that encourages and end justifies the means philosophy, a belief in his home-brewed vigilante justice as a means of karmic retribution, or a self-inflating conviction of social necessity, to name a few. These lines of reasoning are valid rationalizations, but their application seems quite simple, and rightfully so, since more contemporary research outside the field of psychoanalysis has expanded upon the idea of internal conflict and justification. That research falls largely underneath the domain of dissonance theory. Cognitive dissonance was a theory pioneered by social psychologist Leon Festinger in 1957 and subsequently expanded on by his student, Elliot Aronson. Its original conception was fascinatingly simple. Given any two conflicting cognitions, dubbed dissonance, the mind will readily try to reconcile the inconsistency by producing a rationale justifying both cognitions. In the event that a valid rationalization cannot be produced, psychological discomfort results, and because the potential for a negative emotional state exists, most are motivated to address and mitigate the dissonance to avoid such an outcome. A very famous experiment demonstrates this. Student participants were given a tedious task to complete, and on completion, a portion was asked to give a brief introduction of the task, making it seem enjoyable, fun, and interesting to a confederate. In reimbursement, these participants were awarded with either $1 or $20, and then asked to report their experience with the task. In classical reinforcement theory, it would be expected that participants receiving the larger reward would perceive the task with a more positive light than participants who were awarded with a measly $1 bill. This makes a great deal of sense. A bigger reward should make participants hold a more positive regard to the task. The results, however, were the exact opposite. As it turned out, participants who were paid $20 rated the enjoyability of the task much lower than those who were paid $1. Festinger and Carl Smith justified this deviation from reinforcement theory's predictions by departing from reinforcement theory altogether. Instead, they found these results to be in support of dissonance theory. How can this be? Festinger and Carl Smith postulated that since participants in both groups perform the same boring tasks and portray the task in the same fun and exciting manner, both groups experience significant amounts of cognitive dissonance. The difference between the two groups, however, was that the $20 group received greater compensation, which Festinger and Carl Smith argued was external justification that helped relieve dissonance. The $1 group, however, with a much smaller compensation, did not get to enjoy the full effect of external justification, and as a result, must find an alternative route to relieve the psychological discomfort accompanying dissonance. In this case, that route took the shape of an attitudinal shift. In order to reconcile the two conflicting cognitions, one convenient approach is to alter the cognition altogether, so that monotonous task suddenly doesn't feel so monotonous anymore. Thus, participants in the $1 group tended to report greater enjoyability in the tasks, whereas participants in the $20 group, who did not undergo attitudinal shifts, reported lower enjoyability. And thus, cognitive dissonance was revolutionarily conceived as this pervasive omnipresent force continuously motivating attitude formation and cognitive processing. Then, a couple years later in the early 1960s, Festinger student Elliot Aronson, along with J. Merrill Carl Smith from the Festinger Carl Smith study, took dissonance theory a step further, and proposed that dissonance theory was most accurate when the self-concept is threatened, the self-concept being the beliefs that one possesses about oneself. In other words, if one of the conflicting cognitions that an individual holds is about themselves, and the other cognition, typically regarding their behavior, contradicts it, then dissonance would be at its likeliest and strongest. 
Of course, with strong dissonance comes great discomfort, naturally pushing for its reduction, for which there are really only three ways of doing so. The first is an attitudinal shift, the same attitudinal shift that Festinger and Carl Smith identified in their experiment, but within Aronson's edition of the self-concept, the shift refers more specifically to a change in one's attitude of the self, leading an individual to perceive themselves in a different light. For instance, if I were to initially believe that I am really proficient in mathematics, but then perform extremely poorly on a math exam, then I would likely experience a very strong sense of cognitive dissonance. As a result, to relieve the sense of dissonance, one option would be to accept that maybe I am not as good at math as I once thought. And this shift isn't dependent on a positive self-concept either. The reverse of this example is true as well. If I initially had accepted that I am horrible at math, but then ace the same exam, then dissonance still exists, but my attitude towards my ability in math can actually improve in order to achieve consonance. The second method of reducing dissonance is a behavioral shift. Assuming that dissonance is sourced from a conflict between a cognition about the self and a cognition about past behavior, and an attitudinal shift is out of the question, then the focus turns towards the other cognition, seeking to change one's behavior in lieu of their self-concept. Returning to the previous example, instead of becoming less confident in my math abilities because of a failed math exam, a behavioral shift would target the cognition regarding my behavior, meaning I would strive to do better on those exams. This can motivate greater lifestyle changes like devoting more time to study or attending optional office hours. In this way, putting in effort to rectify the behavioral cognition becomes another viable and often adaptive pathway to cognitive dissonance. The third and final method is perhaps most relevant to the discussion of rationalization, in the sense that it itself is quite literally rationalization, known as self-justification. In this process, an individual tries to bridge the discrepancy between the two conflicting cognitions without drastically changing either. This can be achieved in a number of ways, like finding or generating new information to achieve a compromise between the two cognitions, or dismissing the discrepancy as being insignificant. In justifying one's behavior with oneself, the discrepancy causing dissonance is answered, allowing consonance to be established once again. Looking at the conflict arising from Aiden's aims and practices, it's not possible to bring dissonance theory into consideration. It's clear that once it has been brought to his attention, Pierce experiences a great amount of dissonance between what he thinks of himself and how he chooses to act. In his mind, he pictures himself as a protector of both his family and other people, but when the destructive aftermath of his violent means is thrust upon him, he realizes that his actions are contradictory to this belief. In response to this discrepancy, he tries to produce some sort of justification, stating very simply, I have to. Superficially, this justification seems really weak. Just three words. But this sentence implies a strong sense of obligation. Pierce feels obligated to avenge the death of his niece. He feels obligated to keep the streets safe. And in a delusional and twisted way, this obligation combines all three rationales produced earlier. It's also interesting to note why Aiden chooses to self-justify instead of the other two possibilities, and this really boils down to the path of least resistance. As a hypothetical, consider what would happen if an attitudinal shift is chosen in this context. Aiden would come close to accepting that he is not a protector, but rather a threat to both his family and society. The problem is, individuals tend toward a positive self-concept. They like to feel competent, moral, and self-predictable. And if this attitudinal shift were to oppose this stance, it is less likely to be adopted. A behavioral shift is also unlikely, seeing that Aiden's violent behaviors were conditioned from a young age, as he admits. With these patterns of behavior embedded into his personality, it would be very difficult to change. With both alternatives out of the question, that leaves self-justification the job of reconciling the two cognitions, while still maintaining the self-image. Through this process, Aiden is able to stave off internal discomfort accompanying dissonance, and hold on to an intact self-concept. The past few topics have examined the internal processes that drive Pierce's admittedly aversive behavior. But it's not enough to say that Pierce is merely acting upon his innate mental mechanisms. What's perhaps grievously concerning about his actions is that there is a blatant lack of claimed responsibility for the destructive aftermath following in his wake. This has led many to conclude that Pierce is end-all be-all a diagnosed psychopath. But what is psychopathy? How can a psychopath be identified? Is a psychopath the same as a sociopath? And is Aiden either of the two, as some have claimed? Frankly, the popular conception of psychopathy and sociopathy has been muddled by fictional portrayals and semantic widening. Yet, the literature on this topic also seems quite confusing. The latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, abbreviated as the DSM-5, states that the defining feature of antisocial personality disorder, or ASPD, is one and the same with psychopathy and sociopathy, characterized by, quote, a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. Some, however, choose to differentiate between ASPD and psychopathy, arguing that the latter is a separate personality disorder composed of a constellation of traits that capture callousness, impulsivity, and antisociality although no formal diagnosis can be produced for it. In this conceptualization, ASPD can be considered to be a subset of psychopathy, but the same cannot be said for the inverse. Additionally, psychopathy was said to have two factors, primary and secondary, with secondary psychopathy being synonymous with sociopathy. 
Then, in 2002, Delroy Paulus and Kevin Williams published a study detailing the dark trait personality traits, which grouped together three previously conceptualized malevolent characteristics of human personality, one of which was subclinical psychopathy. All of these similar sounding clinical and personality constructs can be confusing, but because of minute differences between them, it would be helpful to develop some working definitions of these separate terms. According to the dsm 5 diagnostic criteria, ASPD can only be identified in individuals that are at least 18 years of age, have a history of juvenile conduct disorder from before the age of 15, and that their antisocial behavior is not exclusively concurrent with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. On top of that, the individual must exhibit at least three of the seven listed symptoms, and only through this process can one be positively identified as having ASPD. Clinical psychopathy, on the other hand, cannot be directly diagnosed in an individual, but cutoffs exist in measures of the construct that indicate if an individual is a psychopath or at least has high levels of psychopathy. As mentioned earlier, this conceptualization is divided into primary and secondary factors. The primary factor describes superficial charm, a lack of empathy and remorse, and manipulative interactions, all of which contribute to patterns of antisocial behavior. Studies have also shown that there are neurological abnormalities that can explain these aversive deviations. Factor 2 psychopathy, or sociopathy, on the other hand, is chiefly concerned with a misalignment of values and morals with an individual's primary culture. That is to say, individuals who score highly in Factor 2 psychopathy would likely possess the ability to experience sympathy and remorse, but their actions are impulsive, aggressive, and do not adhere to social norms, which then manifest through antisocial behavior. And finally, the dark triad traits are composed of three distinct but related personality constructs, subclinical narcissism, Machiavellianism, and subclinical psychopathy. Subclinical narcissism is characterized by love for the self, and the grandiose beliefs of superiority and entitlement that result. Machiavellianism describes manipulative tendencies, often by using others as a means to the end of achieving some self-interested goal. Subclinical psychopathy, as clinical psychopathy would suggest, is characterized by impulsive behavior, calloused emotions, and deficient empathy. Both subclinical narcissism and subclinical psychopathy derive from their psychiatric counterparts, narcissistic personality disorder, or MPD, and ASPD. What makes the subclinical versions different is that they are not personality disorders, and instead set to manifest in the normal population. You and I both have some level of all three traits embedded within our personalities, predicting our actions and interactions. With these terms defined and distinguished, it's time to make an attempt at answering some of the questions posed earlier, namely, is Pierce a psychopath or sociopath? Acknowledging the absence of diagnostic license in this analysis as a major limitation, but proceeding with caution nonetheless, it's possible to compare what is seen in the game to the criteria for antisocial personality disorder per the DSM-5. Three of the four criteria are easily satisfied. Aiden is aged 39 through the course of the first game, which is well past young adulthood, and it's presumed that he had a history of misconduct and aggression in childhood, though a specified age was never divulged, And unless the presentation of the game's narrative is through his skewed or diluted perspective, he does not show signs of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. All that remains is criterion A. Three of the seven symptoms must match with observed behavior. Incidentally, five of these can be directly observed or are referenced to in the game. The first, failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors, as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest. That one's easy. Pierce is very much a criminal. The game literally opens to him siphoning off hundreds of thousands of dollars, not to mention the numerous batteries and murders he commits through the course of the plot. The second, deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. As a grey hat hacker and skilled social engineer, Pierce is capable of and willing to use deceitful means to attain his objectives. His impersonation of others to extract information and usage of a generic pseudonym when infiltrating the Palin Correctional Center, leading to the wrongful arrest of an innocent man, are just select examples of this process at work. Skipping to the fourth, irritability and aggressiveness, as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Another easy one. Aiden is known to be interpersonally tense, even to his allies, and his aforementioned perpetration of violent crimes is another example of this. The fifth, reckless disregard for safety of self or others. Ut Supra, as his violent tendencies often put him, his family, and innocent bystanders in harm's way. Skipping to the seventh, lack of remorse, as indicated by being indifferent to or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. Recall from our discussion on cognitive dissonance that Pierce does not regret his actions until their detrimental effects reach the things he cares about. And even then, he cannot stop these actions, citing an obligatory mandate necessitating his participation instead. From this, it seems that Aiden is a likely candidate for ASPD, though there do exist some inconsistencies with this conclusion. 
For example, Pierce's fundamental capability of experiencing remorse and empathy counts for something, even if it has to impact his self-interest. His harmful behavior could also just be a result of social factors out of his control, and his deceitful and manipulative means can be attributed to alternative etiologies, such as Machiavellianism. Although it's impossible to come to a formal diagnosis with incomplete data and insufficient clinical experience, other non-diagnostic interpretations of the antisocial behavior presented in the game exist as well. Given that Aiden shows symptoms that are similar to those listed by the DSM-5, clinical psychopathy might be the logical next step to explore. There exist several different measures for clinical psychopathy, each with separate strong points. The golden standard often cited for examining clinical psychopathy is the Revised Hair Psychopathy Checklist, or the PCLR. The PCLR is often used in forensic and high-risk assessment settings, but does require administration through a trained clinician. Alternative self-report measures, such as the Psychopathic Personality Inventory or the Levinson Self-Report Psychopathy Scale, seek to eliminate clinician necessitation, but do run the risk of malingering amongst other issues. Among the two self-report scales, the PPI is longer with 152 items, compared to the LSRP with only 26. Accompanying the size disparity are the scale's different approaches to dimensional breakdown. The LSRP discriminates solely between the primary and secondary factors, whereas the PPI is more complex with a total of 8 dimensions. Despite these differences, both try to capture psychopathy completely, have shown to be at least modestly valid and reliable, and have been used extensively in literature. Through both measures, it has been established and reaffirmed that central to clinical psychopathy are empathylessness, social disregard, impulsivity, effective subdual, and exploitativeness, which periodically lends itself to superficial success in occupational settings. Supplementary studies have also shown that high psychopathy is related to utilitarian moral judgment, finding that the impaired emotional processing associated with psychopathy, when moderated by an external factor such as anxiety, aggression, or humility and honesty, reduces moral considerations to the net amount of good over bad put into effect, as opposed to a deontic approach where the expense of one bad action cannot be justified by any amount of good that results from it. Though this results not because psychopaths prefer utilitarian judgment, but rather from a rejection of deontic philosophies and defaulting on their singular alternative. In application to Pierce, there are some parallels, especially with the primary factor of psychopathy. It's repeatedly observed that Aiden shows considerable social disregard to those who are not important to him, and is extremely goal-oriented, using manipulative tactics to achieve his ends. Along factor 2 psychopathy though, there is less of a parallel. Although Aiden also has aggressive tendencies and difficulty attenuating his frustrations, his behaviors are less impulsive and more expeditiously premeditated. The course of the narrative shows very clearly that Aiden has a strong sense of responsibility and is able to commit unwaveringly to a single objective. Lending further support for this distinction, Aiden also readily adheres to utilitarian morality. Even if he questions the clarity of utility calculus, the acknowledgement of the neutralizing effect between good and bad is clearly an endorsement of utilitarian philosophy and a rejection of deontology. Maybe Crispin has to die, but at least we can save this girl. That's something, right? I'm not sure we can add things up so cleanly but we're gonna get her out. Combined with his role as a judge, jury, and executioner, Pierce's physical application of what he thinks is morally proper is an unmistakably personal process. As it happens, a study carried out on psychopathy in incarcerated populations found that Factor 1 psychopaths tend toward utilitarian ethics in personal and high-conflict environments more than Factor 2 or non-psychopaths, though both types of psychopathy were found to correlate with greater utilitarian approaches than non-psychopaths. Because of these aspects of Aiden's personality, there's evidence to suggest that Aiden leans towards primary psychopathy. His behavioral patterns and personality are indicative of an effective, but not social, source. So then perhaps, assuming that Pierce's responses meet a certain numerical threshold, given sufficient psychopathic severity, then yes, he could be classified as a psychopath, but less likely as a sociopath. However, even though psychopathy offers one explanation to Pierce's aggression and manipulation, it's worthwhile to examine how the constructs of the Dark Triad can propose justifications on other aspects of his behavior, starting with a revisitation to vengeance. Thus far, the discussion of psychopathy has broadly characterized aggressive behavior as indiscriminate hostility that can occur under any context. Restricting this to aggression directed in response to some initial transgression, we find that there is more to consider. More specifically, inquiries into how subclinical socially aversive personality traits factor into vengeful actions has revealed that in general, dark triad traits have correlated with a greater affinity for retributive actions within different contexts. In both general and romantic situations, subclinical narcissism has been positively associated with pursuing revenge, though outside of romantic relationships, vengeance was primarily associated with one's tendencies to forgive, which was only mediated by subclinical narcissism. Analogs to this relationship were also established for Machiavellianism and subclinical psychopathy, where it was reasoned that since dark triad traits correlate negatively with empathy, there exists a trend toward low forgiveness, which formulates a conducive environment for retributive behavior to be realized. Interestingly, the strongest associations were found for Machiavellianism and subclinical psychopathy, though this can be explained by the quote-unquote darker nature of and the interconnectedness between the two constructs. 
Ultimately, vengeance, as previously discussed, is an emotionally motivated attempt to restore equity by personally delivering punishment to the original transgressor. Only the propensity for a transgression to trigger this response can be variable, potentially being associated with one's dark triad traits. And in practice, transgressions against the ego or self-image of individuals who score highly in subclinical narcissism tend to be more potent in inducing retaliatory aggression, whereas physical transgressions tend to motivate aggression in individuals high in subclinical psychopathy. These findings seem to be in line with what is observed in watchdogs. As someone who would likely score highly on measures of clinical psychopathy, Aiden would almost assuredly score highly on measures of subclinical psychopathy as well, but not subclinical narcissism. While it's true that dark triad traits have considerable overlap, the core of narcissism, love for the self, doesn't seem to manifest in Pierce's personality to a great degree, which makes sense. Aiden often abruptly aggresses when he or someone he cares about is physically threatened, but in the face of derogatory and pejorative beratement, rarely is there hostile retaliation. The fuck is wrong with you? I wouldn't know where to begin. Feel safe, Nikki. Did you know his voice? Oh, Jesus, Aiden, just leave it. It's fine. It's fine? He thinks he can get inside. How do you know what he thinks? You're checking the lock. <laughs> His psychopathic inclination also explains why he refuses to forgive his transgressors, adamantly determined to fulfill his revenge fantasies as violently as possible. Aside from vengeance, Dark Triad Trace can also offer some thoughts on control. Previously we examined control and its relation to psychological trauma, but discounting those speculations for a moment and isolating control by its lonesome, we can propose an alternative theory for the manipulative elements of Pierce's conduct. Logically, it would make sense for individuals with high Machiavellianism to also have high measures of control. After all, the central principle of Machiavellianism is finding success in one's own ends through the manipulation of others, which requires successful command or control of one's surroundings. But studies show this is not necessarily the case. Correlational studies investigating the relationship between locus of control and Machiavellianism found that Machiavellianism is actually associated with external locus of control, and reasoned that interpersonal manipulation is resultative of one's insecurities about their ability to command their environment, a rectification, so to speak, for their perceived powerlessness. This difference between the two constructs can be explained in part by what manipulation means specifically in a psychological context. In its broadest sense, manipulation is simply any action that seeks to exert change on the environment, which is exactly what control essentially describes. Now, that is a very generous approach, but it is admittedly too generous. In the common vernacular, especially when referring to manipulation between people or interpersonal manipulation, there is a bit of sinister connotation that accompanies its use. So the term requires narrowing. Constraining the definition to describe a distinctly exploitative action, four requirements begin to emerge. Intent. The manipulator must be consciously resolved to bring about some outcome. Complexity. The manipulative task at hand should require some skill or effort. Premeditation. The manipulator should have some predetermined approach to the manipulative task. And self-efficacy. The manipulator should consciously believe that they have the ability to execute the manipulation successfully. Assuming these requirements are met, the process of manipulation can begin. Letting A denote the manipulator, B the manipulatee, O the manipulator's desired outcome, and X the action that B contributes to achieve O, the process commences as follows. Manipulation begins when A wishes to achieve O, but is not able to do so by themselves, but A believes that by recruiting B, B can execute some essential action X that will aid the completion of O. However, A acknowledges that X will not be forthcoming from B, and that attempts to evoke X through motivational tampering will be met with resistance. Because A is inhibited by an unwillingness or inability to coerce B to do X by force, they resort to attain B's volitional assent. Believing that they can successfully exploit B's motivational processes with sufficient knowledge and ability, A attempts to either engineer X from B or procure affirmation from B to do X. Often, successfully manipulating another individual requires detailed awareness and careful adjustment of their emotional states, where high emotional intelligence would certainly be advantageous. Counterintuitively though, Machiavellianism has been correlated with decreased emotional intelligence. It was then theorized that instead of utilizing emotional understanding and maneuverability, Machiavellians tend to rely on cognitive approaches that are more analytical in nature. Due to the specificity of manipulating individuals in a social environment, individuals who are adept and familiar with such processes may not necessarily view their command of others as applicable to the whole of their interactions with the environment, formulating this discrepancy between the two constructs. Additionally, Machiavellianism has been correlated with cynicism, which, in combination with the above, may give rise to the perceptions of futility and meaninglessness, motivating selective participation in highly controllable, low-risk situations. Like all the other topics discussed thus far in this section, the application of these theoretical concepts with limited information is grounded mostly in speculation. Ideally, personality assessments specifically designed to measure Machiavellianism, like the Mach 4, would be used to determine Pierce's disposition towards cynical and manipulative thought and behavior. But in its absence, the observation of externalized manipulative actions will have to suffice. 
From early on in the game's narrative, it becomes evident that Pierce's modus operandi involves playing on others' emotions and motivations in order to take advantage. And although physical coercion is frequently used, there do exist several instances where he tries to induce an outcome peacefully, but not necessarily honestly. One obvious example of this comes to mind, the social engineering of Helena Tucci. In order to obtain information on the mob-organized transfer of prison inmate Raul Lianzo, Pierce required information on the person responsible for the process, Angelo Tucci. For context, the securement of Lianzo was of particular interest to Pierce as he had the ability to implicate Pierce as a vigilante. As such, in order to procure this information, Pierce naturally and quite ironically gravitated towards the most convenient point of contact, Angelo's niece Helena. Before delving into the specifics of this one act, it's already possible to discern whether the situation is one of manipulation and assign situational counterparts to the four variables described earlier. Recall that the four criteria falling under manipulation are composed of intent, complexity, premeditation, and self-efficacy. Here, Aiden definitely intends to use Helena as a stepping stone to Angelo. The use of deception for social engineering requires skill to establish verisimilitude, and his exchanges with Clara, the deuteragonist of the game, reveal his approach and determination to obtaining the desired information. Furthermore, A, the manipulator, is obviously Aiden. B, the manipulatee, is Helena. O, the desired outcome, is the inadvertent divulgence of information regarding Angelo Tucci by Helena. X, the action that B must apply for O to be achieved, is Helena contacting Angelo through some traceable means. Because Pierce requires Helena to reach Angelo, and is unwilling to forcefully coerce an innocent young woman for information, he attempts to lure Helena into voluntarily contacting her uncle, at which point Pierce can obtain said information. Hello? Miss Tucci? I'm Dr. Hyatt with the Chicago General Hospital. We received your Uncle Angelo's blood work, but you're the only number he gave us. Do you know where we can reach him? It's urgent. No, sorry. I haven't heard from my uncle in years. Okay, thank you, ma'am. How exactly he does this is by inflaming suspicion of himself through the deliberate insertion of discrepancies in his communication with Helena. In this way, he is able to motivate her to establish contact with Angelo, seeing that the very premise of her uncle leaving only her phone number as a point of contact for the hospital is strange, but with the inclusion of identifying information, not strange enough to discount his own credibility. Hey Uncle Angie. Helena! You need concert tickets again? No, listen, I got a weird call. I think the cops are looking for you. What? Damn it, you calling me just gave them a trace. Hang up now! Gotcha. This is of course just one isolated example. If Pierce is a manipulative person who believes that manipulation is crucial to his success, there should be a demonstrated pattern of manipulative behaviors. And there is. Throughout the game, there are numerous, albeit less involved, attempts at manipulation. Aiden's intimidation tactics when he first meets Clara is one example. During their encounter, Aiden is visibly irritated and both verbally and physically hostile. Later, it's commented that Aiden was, quote, looking for cracks in the very textbook. Stepping into my personal space, the stare, physical contact, you are trying to look for cracks. So did you find any? Would you love to know? Another instance is Aiden's repeated speculative analyses of Branks' motives, allowing him to make predictions about Branks' future behaviors and playing upon those motives to benefit himself. I need to make this quick. Damien's pride is his weak spot. Just play it up. Convince him to say what he knows. Then drop him. He's too reckless. He's too dangerous. He played me. That son of a bitch played me and I let him. What's he doing, Nicky's? No, he won't hurt them. I'll kill him if he touches them. No, he has to know that. No, he's trying to draw me there. He wants me to work with him. These actions not only establish a repeated pattern of manipulative behavior, but also demonstrate the strictly rational interpretation of an approach to exploiting emotional processes that accompany low emotional intelligence. In fact, Pierce mentions his near intellectual study of manipulation in one of his audio logs. I needed to focus on my mental game anyway. I've been reading up on big cons, social engineering, psychology, intimidation tactics. I needed to be able to win a fight before it even began. I wasn't there yet. It is because of these factors that point to a disposition towards Machiavellianism in Pierce's personality. With personality, the final aspect of Pierce's psychology to be discussed completed, we have pieced together just part of the picture that describes a man devastated by an unparalleled loss, driven by a rage simmering deep inside to remedy a grief through action and action alone. His violent tendencies can be explained through a variety of perspectives, many of which may coexist in a reflect tongue of psychological forces. His predisposition for remorseless violence and manipulation, in conjunction with less than adaptive attempts at coping with irreparable trauma, have contributed to irreversible mass chaos in the game's fictionalized world, collapsing a network of corruption and bringing a technologically reliant city to its knees. 
While it's unlikely that all these elements of psychology were deliberately researched and implemented into the game's narrative, the writer's intuition for capturing how certain human beings behave is certainly something worthy of discussion. It is my hope that through this analysis, you, the viewer, were able to gain a deeper understanding of a few select topics in the behavioral sciences through an interesting yet informative format. Before I close, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Watch Dogs community for their support and inspiration throughout the process of producing this video. I would also like to especially thank my psychology professors for their enlightened guidance and unwavering encouragement. This project would not have been possible without the help of these kind-hearted people. As a side note, I would like to mention that this was my first major video project. I spent well over a year researching, writing, and producing the sounds and pixels you hear and see now. You may notice that my channel is extremely varied as my interests span across a multitude of disciplines, but I try to focus on educational topics. I have several more pieces of informational content that I plan to work on in the near future, so if by some miracle I have not bored you to death already, and you would like to follow what I'm working on next, I highly suggest that you visit my Twitter page or join my Discord server. The latter actually has a neat little progress tracker with which you can use to hold me accountable. Links to both, along with a list of references should you wish to read further into the topics discussed here, will be in the description below. That's it. Thank you so much for watching, my name is John, and this was an in-depth look at the psychology of Aiden Pierce.